Hi everyone, today we're gonna talk about firewalls. So firewalls, remember those devices in movies that hackers always uh, hack and crack and bypass? Now, they have to be some pretty useless devices if they can be bypassed so easily, right? Why do we have them in the first place? Well, let's see. So what is a firewall? Now, contrary to popular belief, a firewall is not a device that is impenetrable. Right? We don't use firewalls to, to block all traffic. If you want to block all traffic, this is what you need. A disconnected network cable. This is what blocks all traffic, not firewalls. So a firewall is a, is a network security device right? that looks at the incoming and the outgoing traffic going to or from your network and decides whether to allow that traffic or to block specific traffic based on some predefined set of security rules. Now, how, how complex those security rules can be or uh, how carefully or how deep can the firewall actually look inside that traffic and make its decisions, this depends on various features of the actual firewall device itself. And the firewalls have evolved a lot over time. Now, they, they started as dumb, very basic packet filtering devices. And nowadays, they've evolved into something absolutely huge. Not huge as in size, but huge as in the number of features, the number of uh, the security techniques and methodologies that they implement to secure your network. Now, they've actually gone so far nowadays that vendors are advertising their own firewalls as all-in-one security devices with all the security features into one single box or one single virtual machine. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. So let's go back to the basics and see exactly what types of firewall we can encounter. Now, the first and the most basic firewall type is called stateless. Okay, so it apparently doesn't have a state. What does that mean? So for this, I'm going to draw an extremely ugly firewall here in the middle, assuming that it connects two networks. So we're going to have a local area network on the left hand side and the Internet on the right hand side. So that's the World Wide Web. And of course, we assume that we do have two connections, one towards the land side and one towards the Internet. And let's also assume that we have two hosts that want to communicate. So on the LAN side, we have a host here, which I'm going to call PC1. And on the internet side, we have another host. Let's say that this one is a public website. And we're going to call this S1, right? From server one. Now, assuming that these two entities want to communicate, they're going to have to go through the firewall. So PC1 first is going to send a request and then server one is going to respond with a reply. Now, the firewall is only going to permit the traffic if it has a valid rule for that specific type of traffic. So in order for our request to go through the firewall, we would probably need a rule that looks like this. Permit all the traffic that you see coming from PC1 and heading over to server 1. All right? This rule would allow the request to go through the firewall. Now, what about the reply? Similarly, for the reply, we would probably configure another rule on the firewall that says permit all the traffic coming from server 1 and going back to PC1, right? All these two rules here would be configured right on this firewall box. Now, do you see a problem here? This configuration here, this rule configuration would allow our PC1 to communicate with server 1. But what if other people inside of our LAN want to communicate with that server 1? Well, we could create a rule for each and every host in this, in this LAN, but it would be much easier to just say something like this. That is, to permit all the traffic coming from our entire LAN going to server 1, and then permit the return traffic from server 1 to anybody who might have initiated that connection from within the LAN. Does this work? Well, it kind of works. Yeah, pretty good. But what if we have more than one server that we want to access? We have the entire internet that we want to access tons of websites and web destinations and, and remote servers that we can connect to. How would these rules look like? Well, we could probably start by doing something like this. Like permit all the traffic coming from our LAN and that is heading towards the entire internet. Which again, it is a valid rule, right? We would expect everybody in a local network to be able to access the internet. Now, what about the return traffic? How would that rule look like? it would look something like this. Permit all the traffic coming from the internet 
heading to our LAN. Does it work? Yes, it works. Do you see a problem with this? We've basically cancelled the entire firewall, right? We're allowing all the traffic to flow through the firewall directly, unimpeded, any kind of connections in either way. So why do we have the firewall in there? <laughs> <laughs> so you can see that this approach where we actually need a separate rule for each type of connection that we want to allow through that firewall is not going to work with a stateless firewall. We need the firewall to be able to track the connections that are being initiated from the LAN and to dynamically know how to allow those responses back to our local network, but nothing else. So if I'm just a regular user, I'm Andrew, right, in my home network, and I want to send a request to access Facebook. Now, the request is going to go through the firewall, of course, because I do need a rule to allow me to access the internet. But I need the firewall to be smart enough to look at that request and figure out that it is supposed to allow the return traffic for that request and only for that request. I'm not going to allow the entire internet to connect back to my local network, back to my host but I will allow whatever traffic I have requested, nothing more. Now, this behavior is actually the behavior of a stateful firewall. It's called stateful because it remembers this state knowledge. It remembers the connections initiated from the inside of our LAN here. Looks at this connection right here, sees who initiated it, sees that it's, it's PC4, sees that it is aimed for server one, and it doesn't just look at the source IP address and the destination IP address, but it also looks at the source port number and the destination port number. Now, the source port number here would be something random, like, I don't know, maybe 35,128. But the destination here would probably be something like port 80. So a rule that we would configure on our own as admins on this firewall would probably look something like this. Permit all the traffic from our local network going to the internet. So nothing new so far. But here's the catch. We only need to configure this single rule right here. Because when the firewall sees a connection being initiated from the LAN, from a PC inside of the LAN, to any destination on the internet, it is also going to automatically create a rule for the return traffic, to allow the return traffic. So we would probably see a rule that looks kind of like this. So the firewall is automatically going to permit all the traffic coming from server 1, from port 80, that's the web server port, going back to PC1 inside of our local network on port 35000, whatever port was chosen when that connection was initiated. And the stateful firewall is smart enough to allow us to configure this rule on the inside interface, the one pointing to our LAN, and the dynamic rule automatically created by the firewall is going to be automatically applied to this outside interface where we expect the return traffic to come back to us. Now, the advantage of this is, of course, you only need to specify the rules that allow the traffic to go out from your network. The return traffic is going to be automatically determined and allowed and permitted by the firewall. That is state knowledge. So the ability of the firewall to look at the state of the connection, figure out, now this has been a request. This is a host in, in the side of the local network attempting to communicate to someone on the outside. I'm expecting a reply from that uh, remote location. So I'm going to automatically create a rule that allows that inbound traffic. Now, how does the firewall know that there's supposed to be a reply coming back or how long is it going to allow this this dynamic rule here to live on the outside interface well the idea behind this behavior is actually related to the fact that the firewall not only looks at the first packet but also looks at the layer 4 information inside of that traffic so it looks at the tcp or udp type of traffic now for a connection to behave just like we described it here we're basically going to talk about tcp connections Right? And as you probably know, the TCP connection is initiated by a three-way handshake, now, which means that we're going to have a SYN packet to open the connection, a SYN ACK packet back to open the connection from the server side, and to confirm the connection from the client side. So I have a synchronization and acknowledgement in the same packet, and then back an acknowledgement from the client. Now, the stateful connection inside of the firewall is actually created the moment the firewall detects 
this send packet coming from the internal network. So for how long is the return rule going to live? How long is the firewall going to keep it in there and allow traffic from the outside? Well, for as long as this connection here is still valid. That is as long as traffic is being transferred. So there's going to be an internal timeout in there if the connection simply dies and no further packets are transferred for 5, 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, then the firewall is going to tear down the rule that allows the return traffic because it's not used anymore or until either a fin message is detected which indicates that one of the parties wants to end that connection or until a TCP reset is detected. That's when you know you're not behaving properly and uh, the other party wants to forcefully terminate that connection and refuse any further communication with you. So the firewall is going to keep that dynamic stateful inbound rule up and running until either the connection is gracefully terminated, forcefully terminated, or simply times out due to inactivity. Now, one thing to remember is that you won't be finding any stateless firewalls anymore in the real life. They are a thing of the past, but do remember how they work for the exam. And also remember that sometimes they are called packet filtering firewalls because that's exactly what they do. They, they have no knowledge about the connection, the state of the connection. They only look at individual packets. And if you want to allow individual packets, you will need dedicated rules for each direction and for each type of packet that is supposed to pass through that stateless firewall. Now, on the other hand, stateful firewalls are the ones that you will find pretty much everywhere. And yes, even the firewall that is built into your home router, no matter how cheap, is still going to be a fully stateful firewall. Now, another type of firewall, so to say, it's called UTM, uh, which stands for Unified Threat Management. And I don't completely agree with the fact that this is a completely different type of firewall, even though CompTIA says so, because it is actually more of a um, marketing term rather than a technology. Basically, it's a combination of the stateful firewall functions that we've already seen and some additional functionality, security functionality on top of that. Uh, things like IPS, traffic inspection, intrusion prevention, or antivirus, malware scanning, uh, URL filtering, filtering traffic based on the reputation or the actual URL of the site that you are about to access from a browser. And we could go even further. Uh, some UTM boxes also provide anti-spam functionality and even DLP functionality, data loss prevention, uh, which basically means that it is able to inspect the traffic up to the actual content, the application layer, and figure out what type of files are being transferred over a multitude of protocols. And then of course, apply some policies and some decisions to deny or allow that file transfer. And actually, if you buy a firewall nowadays, you will definitely get a combination of these services here listed on the, on the blackboard because nobody creates pure firewalls any longer. We have to, to make our security posture uh, stronger, smarter, that is adding an additional security functionality and additional services to our traditional rule-based firewall functionality. Another one that CompTIA considers to be a dedicated type of firewall is a proxy firewall. Again, not exactly found in today's networks as a dedicated device uh, used solely for the purpose of proxying uh, web connections, for example. But it is going to be implemented as an additional functionality onto the firewall, or onto the UTM box uh, for specific applications. And a proxy actually works kind of like a man in the middle for all the connections that go through it. So it's going to terminate the connection on the firewall box with the proxy functionality. And then it's going to initiate an additional connection from the firewall to our internet destination on behalf of the internal client or PC4 here on the left. Now, this uh, connection breakage that happens here in the middle actually allows the firewall to peek inside of the traffic, uh, inspect what is going on in there, even sanitize the contents of that connection, maybe look for uh, abnormal protocol usage, uh, which is also a great way of um, detecting attacks before they, they happen. Now, the return traffic connection is, of course, also going to be proxied onto the same box. 
So the connection is going to be broken again when it comes back to the uh, to the original requester. Uh, but this time we can also implement some additional services like, of course, inspecting what content is being returned from the internet. And also we can provide some caching services. Like the, uh, the proxy can actually uh, hold in a limited amount of memory the most frequently accessed content uh, that your, uh, your network is usually requesting from the internet. And they can uh, serve that content directly from the cache without going to the internet and and requesting that resource every single time. And of course, this is going to help users get a much better experience, lower latency, higher speeds when accessing frequently as accessed content. Finally, the last firewall type, and unfortunately, this one is also a marketing term, is called NGFW, that's next generation firewall. As far as the terminology is involved, I'm really curious what's gonna happen with uh, this term when the next next generation is going to emerge. <laughs> Anyway, uh, next generation firewalls combine uh, stateful filtering, like the stateful firewalls that we've been discussing, with application level security. So they have the ability to look inside the traffic, look inside the packets at the application layer. They're actually able to determine the actual content of the HTTP request or the contents of the of the files that are returned from the from the web server the actual operations performed on an FTP server for example or the domains that we are requesting using uh, using DNS so next generation firewalls are application aware so for example you could use such a, such a next generation firewall to allow access to the internet or to Facebook but at the same time deny access to Facebook chat, to Messenger, Facebook Messenger, or to Facebook games. So we, you do get this granularity in, uh, in your decisions, in your policies, so that you can exactly specify what type of application traffic you want to allow, not just uh, which uh, source and destinations can communicate on or on which ports. Now, they also have advanced mechanisms to fight APTs, for example, and uh, some might also rely on machine learning. And uh, you can also augment the intelligence of a next generation firewall. And most of them actually do this by accessing uh, online reputation feeds. So at any given point in time, whenever you're accessing the internet, you're trying to access a website or download some content, the firewall is going to check the reputation of that location of that of that web page actually or even of the elements in the web page down to the actual hyperlinks in the HTML code and check whether the reputation of the site is going to indicate that there might be malicious content in there or if it's uh, safe to access. And in real life, the differences between uh, all these types of firewalls are not so obvious anymore. Well, apart from the stateless one, perhaps. Uh, most firewalls that you can buy nowadays will be a combination of next generation firewall which, with uh, application awareness and UTM with uh, features such as uh, proxying or uh, traffic inspection, uh, either available as an option, as a pay subscription or enabled by default. Okay, so how should we use a firewall? Well, while we have a lot of advanced threats nowadays and we, we cannot just focus solely on perimeter security, we cannot ignore it completely either. So it actually matters where do you place your firewall. So in a lot of firewall designs out there, you will find about three zones. First off, you have your internal zone, that is your local network, the highest security zone. Secondly, we have the outside or the external zone, and that's in most cases gonna be the internet. That's the place where you can expect nasty things to come knocking at your door. And finally, we might have something called the DMZ, that's the demilitarized zone, connected to the same firewall. Now the DMZ, it's, it still belongs to you, it's still your own network, but it's dedicated to those services that are exposed to the outside world, to the internet. Things that you want people from the internet to be able to reach. Things like your web server that is hosting your company website, uh, your email servers so that you can you know, send and receive emails, uh, the DNS servers so that people can reach your web or email servers, uh, VPN endpoints so that your employees can connect remotely back to your, your home company. So all these publicly accessible and publicly available services will most likely be placed inside of the DMZ. And the DMZ is a special area because normally you would not allow any access from the outside zone, the external zone to the internal one. So the DMZ was introduced to kind of allow admins to define custom security rules that allow some limited 
external access to just some servers, a subset of servers, while still protecting your internal network. And there are two major designs in which you will find the DMZ implemented. The first example is the one that you see here on the screen, with the DMZ as a dedicated interface on the same firewall that acts as the barrier between your internal and your external networks. And there is actually a second type of design that uses two different firewalls, of course connected to each other, but the DMZ in this case is located right between them. So this network segment right here, this one is the actual DMZ. Now you might be thinking, well, this is inefficient. I actually need two firewall boxes to get the exact same kind of behavior. Well, not exactly. You don't actually need two firewall boxes because in real life, this kind of deployment is most likely going to be implemented as a single device. So this one right here is the physical firewall while these two smaller firewalls that you see inside of it are just virtual contexts or virtual domains, or in other words, virtualized instances of the same firewall software, both running on the same box. So just like virtual machines, they actually are running as virtual machines or as containers, you can actually have multiple firewall instances running on the same box, each of them behaving completely independently. You can actually dedicate firewall instances to specific services. Like I want this, uh, this instance right here to only manage uh, VPN services, right? I want this one right here to only manage, I don't know, maybe IPS or, or policy routing for the DMZ. So you can actually multiply your firewalls by uh, just instantiating additional uh, virtual versions of the same firewall software. Now, most of the enterprise firewalls support this feature. Sometimes you'll have to pay for it extra. But in any case, this type of design is doable by leveraging multiple firewall instances. Now, let's talk about firewall rules for just a minute. Now, firewall rules are the actual pieces of information that the firewall uses in order to decide which type of traffic to allow and which type of traffic to deny. So these are most likely going to be configured by you, the admin. Now the firewall rules are often called ACLs. ACL stands for Access Control List and it's exactly what the name says. And the ACL is actually just a list of entries, while each entry describes a type of traffic and an action to take when the firewall detects that type of traffic. Now, how does an access list actually detect that traffic? How does it match on a specific type of traffic? Now, we have a number of ways of doing this. The most basic one would be by IP address, a basic principle, right? In any firewall, you might want to filter for specific subnets, specific VLANs, specific internet destinations by IP addresses. And you can also use this type of IP address based filtering to filter illegitimate IP addresses. Now, what is an illegitimate IP address? Well, for example, uh, let's think, should we be receiving private IP address source traffic from the internet? Most definitely no. Should we be receiving multicast traffic if we know that there is no multicast running inside of our network? No, we should not. Uh, should we be receiving <laughs> traffic from our own loopback on a physical network interface? Again, no. Now, all these uh, IP addresses are sometimes used in uh, attacks that rely on IP address spoofing. So at a bare minimum, you should at least filter against these type of illegitimate IP addresses, which by the way, are called bogons. And there's an actual best practice for filtering this type of IP addresses, and that is called bogon filtering. And I'll leave this link here in the video description to read more about it, but basically it covers just the type of IP addresses that we've just talked about. You can also use access lists to filter by protocol. Basically, you're denying traffic from the outside for protocols that should only be found in your internal network. For example, why would you be receiving a DHCP traffic from the internet? or, I don't know, spanning tree protocol traffic, or SMB traffic for file sharing. Depending on the uh, inspection ability of your firewalls and how the access lists are structured, you can also use them to filter by network application. This is also gonna be a type of traffic filtering, but, but filtering by applications means that the firewall itself has some application level visibility. So it is able to identify multiple applications, for example, running on the same 
protocol or on the same port. Finally, some access lists also have additional capabilities for uh, filtering for specific types of protocol fields uh, like flags, TCP flags or fragmented IP packets. These are important because they can also be part of exploits or network based attacks. So we mentioned that after an ACL entry matches a specific type of traffic, it's going to take one action and these actions can be as follows first we have the accept action just let the traffic pass forward it to rerouting engine because firewalls usually have some routing functionality in them as well and let the packet go on its merry way to the final destination second one is to reject this means blocking traffic and then informing the source of that traffic that its packets have been blocked Usually this is done by sending a TCP reset response or an uh, ICMP port or protocol unreachable message. Now this seems elegant and well educated <laughs> for a network application, but this right here is just free information for an attacker. You're basically telling the attacker that there is somebody in there enforcing security, that there is a security policy that they've encountered. Finally, we have the drop action. This means just ignore the traffic. Don't do anything. This makes hacking a bit more difficult because port scans are not going to return so much information. Of course, if you are not the attacker and you're just trying to troubleshoot your network, this lack of feedback is kind of making your troubleshooting more difficult for you as well. And another really important concept here, in general, firewalls and ACLs as well are based on a concept called implicit deny. This means that unless a specific type of traffic is explicitly allowed through an ACL, that traffic will be denied. Think of the name, access control list. So it's just a list of who has access. If you're not on the list, your access is denied. So remember this, that all ACLs and with an implicit deny at the bottom. Now, some vendors will allow you to see that entry and of course not allow you to change it, to modify it. Others won't, but you have to know that it is in there. If traffic doesn't match an ACL, it's gonna be dropped, denied, rejected, whatever, it's not going to pass. And another important concept when uh, using firewalls, and in fact, when applying access lists, is the answer to the question, in which direction are you going to apply that access list? It could be, inbound or it could be outbound and we're talking here about ingress filtering or egress filtering now normally ingress and egress basically mean uh, whatever type of traffic enters or leaves your firewall but in let's say security speak real life situations will address ingress traffic as traffic that is about to enter your high security network your internal network while egress traffic is about the traffic that is about to leave your internal network. So traditionally, we have always focused on ingress filtering, which is about, you know, keeping the nasty stuff out, keeping it from getting inside of our network. And this still applies, don't get me wrong. There is an entire world full of network-based threats out there. But now with the more advanced threats that we are facing, we have to accept the fact that malware might enter our network without being detected by our perimeter firewall. So we have to focus on containing the damage or the malware that attempts to communicate, for example, with some command and control server on the internet. This is where egress rules come into play. They're gonna stop malware that is already in your network from contacting their, their master, their, their attacker that controls uh, the botnet. Then actually egress filtering is not just useful for blocking command and control traffic but also for blocking access to known malware sites or domains or IP addresses with bad reputation or any other restricted locations on the internet we might choose to deny your users from accessing. For example, you might want to deny your users access to public file sharing services or peer-to-peer -peer downloads like torrents because they're definitely a possible point of entry for malware. You can also rely on publicly available uh, IP and domain name reputation lists. So whenever you see an internal user attempting to connect to a location, to an IP address or to a domain name that is known to have a bad reputation, you can choose to deny that traffic before giving that user the chance to connect to that malicious location and potentially become infected. And not just their workstation, but potentially your entire network as well. You can also use egress filtering to block outside access for any subnets or hosts that should not have 
any kind of internet access that should not connect to the internet. Think about industrial systems, manufacturing engines, or highly secured servers that should not ever connect to the public internet. And another interesting concept here, also related to firewalls, is the concept of firewalking. Now, from an attacker's perspective, a firewall is a barrier, but it's a kind of a barrier that still lets some traffic in, in specific conditions. Otherwise, you wouldn't have an any online presence at all, and you would be much safer simply disconnecting entirely from the internet. So firewalking is a set of techniques for testing, quote unquote, firewall rules, while mapping it from the outside. So basically an attacker who performs firewalking tries to hit the firewall with various types of traffic and watches how the firewall reacts to that traffic. It can rely on setting different TCP flags. It can rely on TTL, that's time to live manipulation. These techniques can be used to locate forwarded ports configured on that firewall that might be sending you directly to some device behind the firewall. So you can use this technique to easily find those, those forwarded ports. And firewalking can be performed in a number of ways. One of them is TTL. Now, TTL is an, a field in the IP header. It can take any value from 0 to 255. Now, the TTL, as the name says, time to live, is actually a very old method uh, starting from the, uh, the beginnings of the IP protocol for avoiding routing loops. Initially, it was designed to measure the time a packet spends inside of a network. It was never implemented that way. So nowadays, as it has been for quite some time, so the TTL nowadays is actually a hop count, where a hop is considered to be any router on the path to the destination, any layer three intermediate device on the path to the destination. And as we said, the TTL was designed as a mechanism against IP packets ending up in an infinite loop uh, in an IP network. So when IP packets are sent, they're initialized with a default TTL value depending on the operating system, let's say something like 64. And on every hop along the way, on every router, that value is decremented by one. Now, what happens when the TTL reaches zero? Well, of course, the packet is not forwarded anymore. But the router that decrements this TTL field and reaches zero also sends back an ICMP message to the originator of the original IP packet, informing the sender that the TTL has expired and the packet cannot reach its destination. Now, I'm sure you can think of a couple of um, benefits from an admin point of view from using this TTL uh, in network mapping, network discovery, uh, reachability testing, and so on. But we can actually use this TTL as a technique for firewalking as well. So in this example right here, uh, host A is attempting to communicate with host B, and we have a couple of routers slash firewalls in between. Now, let's assume that A tries to send a packet here with a TTL of five. Now, this TTL of five is of course going to reach the first router here, which is going to decrement it set it to four, forward it to the next router, which is gonna set it to three, forward it to the next one, sets it to two, then one. And finally, the last one here, the actual destination is going to decrement this TTL field and it's going to reach zero. Now, when this happens, host B is going to inform the source of this traffic is going to inform host A of the fact that the TTL has expired. And this is actually going to be an ICMP message called time exceeded. Now, there's not much use in this message normally, right? We just know that the TTL wasn't enough to reach our intended destination. But if this last device right here was a firewall, so let's assume that this one right here is a firewall. The fact that we were able to decrease the TTL starting from 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and then reaching 0 means that we were able to reach a server behind that firewall. So we found a hole in that firewall. We found a forwarded port. We found a, uh, an access policy that allows us to reach this server. Now, the server might not be configured to answer to any outsider requests or to any unauthenticated uh, sessions, or we might even not even know what ex what type of service that that service uh, that server is running. But ICMP time exceeded messages 
are very often forgotten by admins. People just forget about it. People just allow ICMP because they know it allows them to ping and trace route and so on and so forth. They don't think uh, about specific ICMP messages and what they do. And very often you will receive a time exceeded message from a server that should be protected by a firewall. And this is how you discover that a specific port or a specific uh, IP address behind of that firewall is reachable from the outside. And that's a very important information as an attacker or as a pen tester. And by the way, ICMP time exceeded is ICMP message code number 11. Remember this for the exam, it might help you out one day. Let me just close this video with a short example. What you see here on the slide is an example from the dashboard of a FortiGate next generation firewall from Fortinet. And you can see here on the left that I'm currently in the policy and objects section under firewall policies. So what you see here on the screen, each line is actually a firewall policy defined on this device. Let's, let's just choose one here and uh, try to understand what exactly is going on in here. First of all, you can see that these policies here are listed in a specific order, which is relevant because a firewall normally will search within these these policies from top to bottom and it's going to find the first one that matches a specific type of traffic. Now, when it finds a policy that matches that traffic, it's going to apply the action under this column right here. You can see that most of the rules here are set to accept the traffic. We do have a couple of rules here that deny the traffic. And at the very bottom, we can even see the implicit deny rule which cannot be removed, cannot be uh, modified in any way. And you can see that it is actually a rule that applies to all traffic from any interface going to any interface, applies to any source, any destination, always runs for all services, which means all protocols, all applications, and the action is always denied. So if I don't have any other valid policy that is going to match my traffic, my traffic is going to be implicitly dropped. Now let's go back here to one of our examples. This policy here, you can see it has a name and an ID. Under the from column, we're going to see two interfaces. Now normally you would think about the fact that if a firewall has a number of physical interfaces, you can only define policies between those physical interfaces. That is not true because we can also have uh, virtual interfaces as well, like VLANs or sub interfaces. In this case, we have two traffic sources, two interfaces. The first one is a VLAN and I believe the second one is also a VLAN as well. All right, now under the two column, we can see we have a physical destination. This is the WAN uplink destination. It's a 10 gigabit per second physical interface located on the actual device. All right, so all the traffic that comes from these two VLANs and attempts to exit this physical interface is gonna be subjected to this firewall policy. Now the source and the destination refer to subnets. Uh, in this case, the all keyword means I don't exactly care what IP addresses are coming from those, uh, those VLANs or what kind of IP addresses uh, my users are trying to access as a destination. I'm just going to match all traffic. Next one is the schedule. As part of the next generation firewall policies or more advanced firewalls anyway, you can actually create firewall policies that run on a predefined schedule. So you might have a set of policies that apply during work hours, not a set of policies that apply outside working hours or during weekends and so on. The service column is going to state the protocols that are matched by our policy. In our case here, you can see that we're using again the all keyword, which matches all the protocols. But if we look under other policies under the same column, you can see that uh, there are policies that apply only to certain protocols, like for example, syslog and DNS. Moving forward, NAT is a very typical type of policy, traffic policy that applies to firewalls. Firewalls will most likely perform network address translation as well. Not for all policies, of course, but if you use a firewall as an internet connection device, you will probably perform NAT for any connections that attempt to reach the internet. Next up, under the security profiles column here on the right, you can actually see the advanced functionality available in a next generation firewall. And that's exactly what we talked about a couple of minutes ago. Now, if you remember, we talked about next generation firewalls and UTMs, and there's a lot of overlap between these two marketing terms, but basically they both refer to devices that are not just stateful firewalls, but devices that are able to inspect traffic up to the application level, and also provide additional security features, such as antivirus monitoring or uh, application identification web traffic monitoring, 
IPS traffic inspection, intrusion prevention here, and finally SSL. In this case, this is an SSL inspection, but it can also be an SSL offloading service. Now, all these are security profiles that can be assigned to a firewall policy, and they're gonna be automatically applied to all the traffic that matches this specific security policy. So you can pretty much imagine that to be able to provide antivirus monitoring to a simple policy that matches all traffic and all protocols, well, that firewall should be pretty smart in uh, you know, decomposing traffic, reassembling the actual files within an HTTP or an FTP transfer and figuring out if those files are malicious or not. So this is definitely deep packet inspection, sometimes even traffic decryption. And this is certainly application level awareness and intelligence. Last column here is about logging. Uh, depending on your uh, your environment, you might want to log all traffic or you might want to log only denied traffic, everything that was dropped by your firewall because that kind of traffic has some potential of being malicious. And finally, the last entry here shows you exactly how many bytes have matched this policy. It's a great way to validate that the policy is actually matching the traffic that uh, you're intending to match and also works quite well for uh, reporting purposes. So that's an example of a next generation firewall slash UTM device called FortiGate available for Fortinet. By the way, you can access this uh, this demo publicly, it's freely available for everyone. Of course, you only get read-only access here, but it's more than enough to figure out what are the uh, the potential capabilities of this uh, this platform and of pretty much any next generation firewall slash UTM uh, device available for uh, from other vendors out there. All right, so I really hope you found this section useful and informative because firewalls are becoming a critical infrastructure component in anything related to security nowadays. Now they're becoming a security in a box type of devices <laughs> where companies are trying to implement everything that is related to security in one single device. Now if they've succeeded this or not uh, remains to be decided, but they're definitely one of the most important devices that you will find in enterprise networks, especially from a security standpoint. So for the exam, make sure you understand the purpose behind firewalls. Make sure you understand uh, what is um, what are the typical types of firewalls that you can encounter. Uh, make sure you familiarize your, yourself with uh, with the names, even though even the marketing ones. Make sure you understand the basic concepts of matching traffic and then acting on it, allowing it or denying it. Remember that there's an always implicit deny rule in pretty much any firewall or access control list out there. And make sure you understand the purpose behind firewalking as well. So thank you so much for watching. Like and subscribe if you found this useful. Good luck on the exam and see you next time.